This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University, and today I want to talk about how to launch a speculative currency attack using Bitcoin. This is based on a famous old paper that Pierre Roche, by uh, Pierre Rochard that I just got around to reading. Very good paper that's uh, hosted over at the Nakamoto Institute that I'll link to below. But the basic idea is this. We're going to start with a currency. We're going to pick a currency that's much less stable than the U.S. dollar and look how bit look at how Bitcoin might affect it. So let's say that Indian investors in India decide that they're bullish on Bitcoin. The price has been going up. And so they keep buying Bitcoin, which puts pressure on, drives the price of Bitcoin up in rupee terms. Maybe they start to borrow in rupees to buy Bitcoin as well, to buy it on margin. And so what happens, both of these actions cause the price of Bitcoin to go up in rupee terms. We're looking at the Bitcoin rupee exchange rate. Now, if a lot of people do this in India, then Bitcoin will get expensive in rupee terms. It'll be more expensive in rupee terms than maybe it is in US dollar terms or euro terms. So then what happens is the arbitrageurs, the people who do arbitrage with large amounts of capital, will come in, they will take their US dollars and they'll buy Bitcoin with it. They'll move that Bitcoin over to an exchange where they can sell it for rupees at this over valued rate. And then they'll sell these rupees, those rupees that they get from the sale of the Bitcoin for US dollars. So there's kind of a triangle that goes on here. This is what currency arbitrage looks like. But what does this do to the rupee versus the US dollar? Well, these uh, arbitrage investors are shorting rupees and going long the US dollar. If this is done in size, it, on the margins, it causes rupees to go down versus the US dollar. A really weak rupee is a problem for the Indian central bank. If it, if it continues to weaken, that makes uh, imports very expensive for the people. And so the central bank may be forced to raise interest rates to try to, try to defend the rupee or even use its FX reserves to buy rupees. So if it has some US dollar reserves, it can go into the market and sell dollars and buy rupees with it. But there are limits to how high a country can move up its interest rates. There are limits to the currency reserves that countries have, especially non-G5 or G7 countries. Now, will raising interest rates stopping Indian investors from buying Bitcoin, making their margin rates more expensive, etc.? Probably not, simply because when you have an asset like Bitcoin that goes up on average about 100% a year, in bullish years it goes up much more than that as we've seen in 2020. But as long as you're making as long as you're making a, a higher interest rate in terms of your Bitcoin return in local currency terms than you're paying in interest rates, you're still happy to keep borrowing at that. And so if Bitcoin goes up roughly, call it 50% a year or 100% a year, whatever it is, going forward, technically you would need, the, the Indi Indian central, central Bank would need to raise interest rates close to 100% in order to stop this, simply because if you can borrow at 20% uh, interest rates and still make 100% a year on your money, you'll do that all day long. And so this is a mechanism by which I mean, when, when Pierre Rochard wrote this paper, this was still very far off. Bitcoin wasn't very large in terms of market cap in 2014. But we're now entering the point in history when we can begin to see weird things happen as Bitcoin's market cap gets bigger than the money supply of small countries or even medium-sized countries. If enough people in vulnerable currency countries like Venezuela, Turkey, Lebanon, these kinds of places, if they buy Bitcoin just out of self-interest to preserve their savings when the local currency is being massively devalued, if enough people buy Bitcoin in, the, in their local currencies, it could cause a number of these currency crises worldwide. And if you get enough of them going, there could be some serious, uh, some serious pressure and some blow-ups of countries' currencies. If you're enjoying this video and finding it helpful, take a moment right now and just hit that subscribe button. Now, something similar happened. I think Rochard's taking this idea of a currency attack, uh, really inspired by the, by the George Soros famous trade where he shorted British pounds and forced the British government to pull out of the euro, European exchange rate mechanism in 1992. Basically, all the speculators like Soros, they kept selling pounds and the, uh, the UK central bank, Bank of England, 
was not able to buy all those pounds and defend it. And so the currency actually weakened massively against all, against this basket of European currencies. And so something similar could happen with Bitcoin in the US as well. Every time you take some of your US dollar savings, as I've done, and I know a lot of you have done, and put it into Bitcoin, you're making Bitcoin go up a little bit on the margins. Obviously, if you or I invest $1,000, it's not uh, it doesn't move it quite as much as someone like Michael Saylor putting hundreds of millions of dollars in. But on the margins, this does have effects, especially when a lot of people start doing it as they have in the last couple of months. So Bitcoin goes up versus the US dollar. The more the Bitcoin price goes up, they call it NGU, number go up technology. This is the this is the free advertising for Bitcoin. The more attention it gets, the more buyers come in. And the more buyers come in, the larger the market cap of Bitcoin grows. And the larger it gets, the more it enables really large investors to come in, large institutional investors. So if you're a blue whale, you can't swim in a regular swimming pool. You've got to wait, wait until that swimming pool is the size of maybe a small or medium lake. And it's very similar for large investors. If you want to invest $100 billion, $10 billion into Bitcoin and it has a market cap of only $100 billion, as it did a few years ago, you can't really take a 10% position. There's too much movement. But if the larger the market cap of Bitcoin grows, at each new level, it brings in new buyers, larger and larger institutional buyers, corporations, pensions, endowments, eventually central banks themselves. When the Bitcoin market cap hits $1 trillion, it's currently, I want to say, at $400 uh, 430 billion. When the market cap hits 1 trillion, then you get all these large institutional investors, as we said, coming in. And so the more people who buy Bitcoin, whether it's in dollar terms or rupee terms, the stronger Bitcoin gets. It gets bigger, its security budget goes up, the network itself gets stronger, it becomes more difficult to mine, the, ha the hash rate goes up, and the network gets stronger as the price goes up because it becomes more difficult to launch a 51% attack or any other sort of attack. It becomes more expensive to try to break the network and add some fake blocks to the blockchain at very high energy levels. This becomes very cost prohibitive. Michael Saylor, as we said, MicroStrategy CEO, moving all of MicroStrategy's cash into Bitcoin, strengthens Bitcoin and weakens the US dollar. So this is an example of what he did moving that cash into Bitcoin was very similar to what happens if you or I take some of our US dollars and buy Bitcoin with it. But there's a whole different level that he has taken it to and that can become part of this ongoing speculative currency attack. And that is borrowing money in order to borrowing money in order to buy Bitcoin. And this is what MicroStrategy did. They issued these convertible notes and they pay an annual interest rate on them. They, they might be able to, they may have the option of, uh, or they have the option of converting it into stock, et cetera. But the basic idea is you borrow $650 million at this very low interest rate, less than 1%. And then you use that to buy Bitcoin. This is what MicroStrategy did. So not only did they take all their cash and move it into Bitcoin, but they magically created new cash through the power of debt, through the power of borrowing, and they use that to buy $650 million more of Bitcoin, or they're in the process of, of doing it now. I haven't followed it too closely. But what this does is it creates more US dollars. It increases the money supply. And as such, it's like printing money it makes the price of Bitcoin go up. And so if the US dollar is falling at 8% per year against real assets like real estate, maybe gold, Bitcoin is falling at a much higher rate, it makes sense to borrow US dollars at interest rates of 8% or less or whatever that rate is and buy those assets. If the US dollar, if Bitcoin's going up 50% uh, or 100% in US dollar terms, it's actually up more than 200%, but let's say it's going up 100% in US dollar terms, you would be fine actually borrowing up to that rate if you were a large institutional investor. It's very difficult for individuals to do this, uh, but I'm gonna show you a way in a second. But the point here is that basically borrowing to buy Bitcoin is the form is a form of launching a speculative account attack, a speculative currency attack on the US dollar. When you buy, when you borrow US dollars to buy Bitcoin, this makes the price of Bitcoin go up. 
uh, versus your, your bind. Now, any individual can do this in a sense. So if, for example, if you buy Bitcoin, instead of using that same money to pay down your mortgage, for example, to make your monthly uh, principal payment or to even pay off a mortgage in full to pay off the principal, if you do this, you are actually a leveraged Bitcoin investor. You have the, the mortgage debt against your house, but your balance sheet doesn't really care. You can pretend that your house is paid off or that a percentage of it is, and that percentage is actually allocated to a leveraged position in Bitcoin. So what's the moral of this? Well, the more people who not only move their US dollar savings into Bitcoin, but also borrow US dollars to buy Bitcoin, the more the US dollar is weakened and the stronger Bitcoin gets. The stronger it gets, the more the price goes up, the more it begets even more momentum and more buying and more strength in the Bitcoin network. The higher, the more the price goes up, the more people want to own it. And what you could have is a situation where this continues, where the, the market cap of Bitcoin continues to grow and surpasses the market cap of whole country currencies. Eventually, the US dollar. This is what will eventually happen, in my opinion. There's never been a world reserve currency that's lasted more than 100 years or so. The US dollar is right at the end point there. So I think Pierre Rochard was really ahead of his time uh, writing this article. We are going to see these sort of speculative currency attacks in smaller countries, smaller economies, uh, smaller market cap currencies, maybe like the rupee or some South American currencies or some African currencies. And then eventually it will move on to the major currencies, the euro, the yen, Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, and US dollar, all of which have been depreciated versus have been depreciating versus Bitcoin, but we would expect that trend just to continue as Bitcoin begins to take on a life of its own. I love the way uh, Rochard entitled this uh, this picture. He called it uh, the Joker demonetizing the US dollar. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.